Dobryutra Jaborowski. So the United States is in an election year, showing the world how democracy should be done. It's also election year in Russia, and we'll be hearing any number of lectures on Russia's managed democracy as it rubber stamps a new reign for Tsar Vladimir Putin. Of course, the United States has long been the poster child for one-party states, as in Dixie, for nepotistic crony boss machines dragging on for decades, like Chicago, and for insider fixes at the highest level, when a partisan Supreme Court granted the presidency to Republican Party heir W. Bush. It's led the world in disfranchisement, in its robbing poor and black Americans of the vote by poll taxes and other restrictions, some of which local governments are again instituting for reasons of class and race. All of this doesn't stop the U.S. and A. one moment from unashamedly wagging its finger in the world's political face. Never mind all that. Do as we say, not as we really do. This is the defense of parents, missionaries, and conquerors from the dawn of human identity. The U.S. is convinced that its version of democracy, however corrupted in practice, is the only true ideal form, the textbook definition of the theory itself. Much as the USSR held that it alone possessed the magic key to socialism and thus the whole future of humanity. For this reason, American power thugs like Hillary Clinton and Madeleine Albright and Condoleezza Rice have been busy bees around the world enforcing American democracy from the barrel of a gun or the tip of a cruise missile. This is the action component of globalization. Just as the American economy is gamed by entrenched oligarchies known as corporations, American democracy is also a managed staged procedure. A game whose outcome may vary, but whose rules are fixed no, so that no matter who wins, you lose. But here I'm not going to dwell so much on how the system is gamed at home. Let's see how it behaves when it's in missionary mode, with two examples. Not Iraq, not Afghanistan, but from the Western Hemisphere itself. Nicaragua, in 1990, held supposedly free and open elections, ending a totalitarian tyranny. Ignore the fact that it had elections in 1983. Those, by definition, had to have been rigged by the Marxist Sandinistas, while those in 1990 were free and fair, meaning that the U.S. was allowed to pimp money to its favorite candidates through subsidized NGOs, like the National Endowment for Democracy, the Center for Democracy, the Carmen Group, the National Democratic Institute, and the National Republican Institute, the latter two being the foreign policy arms of the Democratic and Republican parties of the United States. In other words, the system is rigged when the Marxists slant the voting rules, but when outside interests based in the U.S. can funnel investment capital into the local political process, this is free speech. This is open, free, and fair democratic process and action. And surprise, the United Opposition candidate, Vila de Chamorro, won. But was it through the electoral process alone? Aren't we forgetting the barrel of a gun, that foundation for all rule of law, all political process? Seems to me that I believe I can recall a nine-year sabotage and terrorist effort by the United States using a cutout army called the Contras. By destabilizing the country and its economy in a war of attrition, it made the place exponentially unable to function. Then elections were offered as a way out. The Sandinistas naively, naively believed that elections by themselves are intrinsically fair processes, but that's no more true than believing trial by jury is unbiased by its nature. And Ms. Chamorro was all through the 80s the poster girl for the Nicaraguan Democratic Force, the Congress political front based in Washington. Democracy in Nicaragua in 1990 was thus in practice a classic case of racketeering. The Godfather sends thugs to wreck your house and promises you peace if you see things his way and let him buy into your business. The U.S. even went so far as to threaten to discredit the whole election it helped set up if the Nicaraguan government interfered with the NED making payments to Chamorro's party. This is how the, Nic the democratic process in Nicaragua was gamed from the inside, just like home, eh, boys and girls? Well, let's fast forward some 12 years and see an example where American democracy was thwarted by a country's own people, in Venezuela. As you likely know, Venezuela is run by yet another evil Marxist regime. The fact that its Marxist dictator was elected by a majority of Venezuelan voters in an open election is beside the point. Hugo Chavez made fun of W. Bush, subsidized Fidel Castro with oil, announced himself a socialist, and so he had to go. Just like Salvador Allende in Chile in 1973. So the democratic process was again cranked up in Washington. Into Venezuela came the U.S. media and the U.S. subsidized NGOs, linking up with the Venezuelan opposition and the Venezuelan media, which is controlled by the opposition, who make Fox News seem as fair and balanced as it claims. Money was funneled into the opposition parties, democratic action in particular. While the claims of the opposition media were reported in the U.S. as fact, that Venezuela was another Cuba with opposition silenced and no one's property safe. This came on the heels of Chavez's land reform in November 2001, with all of the business and property classes against him for obvious reasons. 
So were many state sector workers due to back pay problems caused by falling oil prices. In the old days, one would smell a CIA rat in this orchestrated smear campaign, but with the rise of the NGOs, this was all done above board. The openly broadcast motive was not just to protest the government's policies, but to force Chavez out of office by street demonstrations and hold new elections. So the very ones vilifying the Occupy movements in the U.S. are the very same ones who think these tactics are okie-dokie in someone else's park, even when pushed to the point of violence. Take note there, Tuberistas. The tipping point in Venezuela came when the opposition and its funders clashed with Chavez supporters in the street and the opposition media portrayed those supporters as shooting at the opposition. This was the cue for opposition supporters in the military to jump the gun. Comandante Hugo was deposed in a palace coup in April 2002. Chavez was held in Comunicado and by several accounts was to be assassinated in secret. The first thing the coup makers did? Hold free and fair elections? No. They signed a martial law decree abolishing all democracy, which was hailed by the opposition and the United States and President Bush II as the first step towards civil society. That would figure, considering what went on in Washington a year or so before, wouldn't it? But the naive Venezuelan rabble raised such a stink that it threw the plotters in Caracas and Washington into confusion. They dared not kill Chavez to institute new free and fair elections after all. The military backed down, Chavez was released, and was back in the palace stronger than ever. Of course, the crusade for democracy didn't stop there. Next followed a crippling oil strike and a public occupation of Plaza Altamira. Despite massive media coverage and foreign subsidy, by the very ones demonizing this tactic at home, remember, this still went nowhere. Next came a media-organized recall movement. Petitions with often bogus signatures were circulated countrywide. The NED-funded group Sumate was running the recall drive, with its spokeswoman, Maria Corina Machado, lionized by the U.S. media as a pro-democracy activist battling a totalitarian machine. Only, of course, if Venezuela was a totalitarian machine, she'd hardly be popping up on TV dressed like the ex-beauty queen she was and receiving her share of the NED's million-dollar-a-year funding. Yet Chavez emerged from the recall referendum stronger than ever. Even so, the guardians of democracy in the North just couldn't accept it. The former Assistant Secretary of State for Inter-American Affairs, Bernard Aronson, wrote an op-ed piece for the New York Times in August 2004 calling Chavez Venezuela's fake Democrat. In the Orwellian doublespeak we in the U.S. know so well from our media, Mr. Aronson wrote, Chavez represents a new breed of Latin autocrat, a leader who is legitimately elected but then uses his office to undermine democratic checks and balances and intimidate political opponents. Well, there may be room for criticism of Comandante Hugo, but the U.S. seems also to advocate another unique pioneer form of democracy, supporting the attempt to bring down an elected president by riot and coup that institute martial law. Another Times op-ed piece by the former Venezuelan Minister of Trade and Industry was titled Hugo Chavez and the Limits of Democracy, How Free Elections Led to Tyranny in Venezuela, which means elections aren't really free unless the right side wins. Hmm, can I come the phone? Might be the Koch brothers telepimping from Mitt Romney. Hello, Boris Yeltsin, Russia's first democratically elected president. Well, Gorbachev was the USSR's first democratically elected president, so he doesn't count. Turn the music down, Boris Nikolaevich. You're not running for office now. Playing that funky white boy music was how you danced yourself into a heart attack. That's better. So what brings your voice out of that great vodka bottle of the beyond? To let our viewers know that democracy can't work without money any more than your limousine could run without gasoline. That's why you had to let the oligarchs invest in your election or it couldn't have gone anywhere. And also thanks to your American media advisors and their attack ads, the democratic process prevailed. Only the whole thing was gained by oligarchs and the mafia, so where's the democracy? Hey, if America says you were elected free and fair as righteous democratic reformer, that ends the conversation. You're the role model for Venezuela and Cuba and Syria and Iran and North Korea and all those anti-Western regimes waiting for the democratic axe to fall. And if the democratic opposition in those places don't have any oligarchs to buy the free election for them, that's why there's the American taxpayer. When he's not being maced by the cops and driven from his own public streets, 